subject of the day. It's there on the label, Phalaenopsis Schilleriana. Oh yes, and thank you, thank you for joining me on this Care Collab video here with Danielle's Orchid Ranch and Simply Orchids, etc. Rhea P. And why am I staring at a silver root? Oh, because I love them. I would prefer it to be a growing tip, but I love these metallic roots. Incredible. I don't get to see them much because of my setup, which is lecker and self-watering. So when they stick out like that, I always gawk at them. I think they are ever, ever so pretty. And I also like the leaves. Something that orchid hobbyists enjoy is nice foliage when the orchid is not in bloom. I believe that this is a common banded Schilleriana, simply because I did get her from Großrechner Orchidin, and uh, the silver leaf, the real other one, they are more difficult to find, and I am guessing this is just a common banded mottled leaf Schilleriana from Luzon. The Philippines, what a place that must be. And all the islands around the archipelago of the Philippines. It's paradise for orchids, I guess. So let's get this camera onto a stand and let's have a closer look-see at my Phalaenopsis chilleriana and how I care for it. So welcome once again. This is again the care collab between Daniel's Orchid Ranch and Simply Orchids, etc. Rea P. Phalaenopsis Schilleriana. So let's drop some names here. I guess everybody can read in the archives of the Google that it was a Professor Heinrich Reichenbach that initially was the first to describe this orchid. And he did so in the Hamburger Garten Blumenzeitung. However, it was the first ever blooming of this orchid outside of the Philippines, which gives credit to her name and that is Consul Schiller and he was a consul, not an ambassador, but a consul to the Philippines and was given as a gift in Manila this orchid. It was Reichenbach then that decided to say, okay, you get the kudos for blooming her for the first time. So he called her Schilleriana. But I would, what I always thought was so interesting is to hear people call something as beautiful as this a moth orchid. I don't see moth in this one at all. But there's a reason, there's a reason why we have a Phalaenopsis. Because initially, a long time ago, but now obsolete, Phalaena was the classification for moths. Opsis is where we also get the word optics from, and that refers to look. So Phalaenopsis, the moth look, or the flower that resembles a moth. Hmm, <laughs> I don't know. Now my blooming hasn't opened yet. I have left it to the wire, absolutely to the wire. I was hoping to get a little bit more open blooms, but we have a date, it's a care collab, and we have to honor the deadline. But I do not see anywhere here anything that resembles a moth. I never understood that. But never mind. that is what they named it, and this is Phalaenopsis schilleriana. My spike is nothing to write home about at this point in time. And quite honestly, I'm a little bit disappointed. I've got this orchid now three years and I was expecting progress. I was expecting it to get a little bit larger and the spike a little bit more substantial. Maybe an additional branch this year. This looks like a spike as I had last year. So there has been no progress. And my blooms look very much smaller as well. The blooms here should be about double the size than what they are, if not bigger than double. But because my orchid isn't as mature yet, I can expect, you know, smaller blooms, but not like this. This is far too small. Now there is certainly a, a thing that can happen here is as the blooms age, they will grow and enlarge, but they won't. Not in my case, they will not get to the size that they're supposed to be. So what am I doing wrong? Well, here's, the, here's what I am doing, and then I'll tell you about what I believe I'm doing wrong. And as the sun comes out, I better change the angle of the camera. There we go. So 
Here's what I'm doing. I'm growing her in my preferred setup of LECA and self-watering. And she never objected to that from the moment that she arrived. I didn't have to be uber cautious. I didn't have to wait for a transition. I cleaned her up, I put her in the pot, and we never looked back. I fertilize her during the winter months at 160 parts per million. And that is half of what I do when she starts to get into active growth. And my fertilizer goes in at 5.8 pH because of my LECA. My LECA pH comes out of the storage bucket at eight. So I reduce the pH in order to somehow give the orchid a balanced pH as it wicks up the water and into the pot. And I just guesstimate that at that time, the orchid can actually get all the nutrients it requires to be healthy. My orchid is not unhealthy, she's doing well, but she has another thing that keeps happening. Every time she starts new roots, I, I lose a leaf. So I've never managed to go beyond three leaves on this orchid, and I would like to change that. I would like to be able to have her hold on to at least one leaf and not keep dropping them every time she starts new roots. I have not yet figured out whether that has something to do with the fact she needs more of an element, be it calcium or nitrogen, or it is possible that I need to reduce my pH even further to about 5.5 so that she has a more acidic environment around her root ball in order to be able to absorb the calcium, the nitrogen, and everything like that. And that is what I'm going to be doing in the coming season once she's finished blooming because the idea is after three years I should have at least double what I have now in bloom count and I should have as big blooms at least as I did last year. They shouldn't be getting smaller. On the contrary. So 300 parts per million when actively growing. And we can wait and see whether she's actively growing or not. But I can't wait and I can't see because my pots aren't clear. So right now, 160. When this reservoir is dried up, she's going straight up to 300 parts per million. I'm not waiting to see any kind of new leaf growing or a leaf dying back, which is a signal she's growing roots. When this blooming is finished, I'm going to pump her up straight away to 300 parts per million, and I'm going to reduce the pH down to 5.5, especially for this pot. I don't do that across my entire collection. There is no need. But here we have a case of why aren't you flourishing and thriving? She is not doing badly, but she is not doing what she should be doing either. So tidying over an orchid and getting teeny tiny blooms like this, I mean, you can see just how small they are. That makes no sense. So there is something going on that she's okay with and she will live and she will survive, but she won't thrive. And I believe that has something to do with a pH basically because of how she lives epiphytic and she is constantly wet in the warm, warm, humid climes of the Philippines. And none of these factors do I have when it comes to my natural environment. I have a warm climate, but it is super dry and I don't have her warm as she wants all year round. So there are certain stress factors that I believe I need to counteract somehow. She doesn't like to go below 20 degrees Celsius and prefers not to go above 28 degrees Celsius in the summer. Well, my winters go down to 14, as was the case this past winter of 2021. 14 degrees Celsius. I usually used to hover around 16 degrees indoors. And my summers can get way over 30 degrees very easily for several months on the trot. I have extremely dry, hot winds. I do not have any humidity that I can actually consider humidity. I do not supplement with a humidifier either. And in the winter, I also do not use heat mats to keep her toasty. So these are all factors that could be playing a part as to why this blooming has gotten a little bit itty bitty this year, simply because her winter was a little bit too cold for her liking. And here's the conundrum because you need to drop the temperature in order to introduce spikes on this one. It's just like a complex Phalaenopsis hybrid that you get out and about in your supermarket. 
it still needs that temperature drop. But a temperature drop, let's say, if it always has 28 degrees, and then in its winter, it drops down to 20 degrees, that is an eight degree temperature drop. It's all relative. It doesn't say that it has to drop to 14, 15 degrees Celsius in order to induce a spike. The point is there has to be a temperature drop, regardless of which margin it is. However, for what it prefers, it doesn't want to live in a 14 degrees Celsius environment in winter. So these are the little factors that I'm going to be tweaking. In the meantime, I have to say that I am not yet experiencing her fragrance either. These blooms have only just started opening. And like I said, I've been really keeping it late. I wanted to have them open more flat and have a prettier presentation, but none of that is happening. But let's go in a little bit closer and see what we can see of what I have to show for. If I can do it with the angle, because here comes the sun. So the fragrance is supposed to be something of a very, very delicate rose, but strong. The fragrance is intense. When it comes out, it is very, very intense. Some Philonopsis Schillerianas will not be fragrant. There is a certain type called Wilson, which is highly, highly fragrant. Mine is not a named variety. So I was very fortunate to, that eventually it did push out a fragrance. And it can last two to three days from a bloom opening before the fragrance actually becomes obvious in the room. You don't have to be up close to the flowers to be able to smell her. She is very, very strong. It's a rose fragrance, but not every Shillerini has one. And if you want to be 100% sure, make sure you get the named cultivar Wilson, because they are the ones that are coveted because of their guaranteed fragrance. I will not be able to say until the next video whether mine this year will be fragrant at all. But she is very, very beautiful. And I, I, I still don't see how this is a moth. I don't get it. Makes no sense to me. So if somebody can enlighten me in the comments below, I very, very much appreciate it. She's very, very beautiful. I'm very glad actually to have a Shilleriana. She was a mistake. She did not come to me because I purposely bought her. I wanted a Caplia Shilleriana and I got her instead. Grossrechner was kind enough to recognize the mistake they had made and they said, you can keep her, because I was gonna send her back. Initially, I thought, nah, everybody has one. I'm okay, I can watch and grow vicariously via the YouTubes. I just wanted the Caplia Shilleriana, but hey, they said, not a problem. Please don't send her back, you keep her. And I did, and here she is, and I'm actually quite glad about it. With regards to light, I can say that I have a very different light level here in southern Spain. When I say bright shade, it is bright shade, no direct sun, but it is intense. And I also have a lot of white reflecting walls, but I don't give her direct sun at all. That would be only possible in other hemispheres that she can tolerate some direct sun as long as there's plenty, plenty of air movement around her, because these leaves will burn if you give her direct sun and there is absolutely no air movement or no fan going whatsoever. I do not risk that. I have her indoors all year round. Um, as the angle of the sun recedes and goes higher into the sky, it doesn't enter my dining room as much anymore. And I push her more and more and more forward towards the window. So she actually comes right up against the window where it's always warm and toasty there no direct sun whatsoever and the reverse is true in winter. As the sun lowers in the sky I start to move her bit by bit back on the shelf as well so that she doesn't get burned. So that is how I do try to take care of my Shilleriana up until now and I will be tweaking what I'm doing immediately with regards to when she's finished blooming and how I'm going to continue with the fertilizer. I'm not going to wait now for active growth before fertilizing. I want to see if it is possible to get this variety, which I believe is the common one, to grow leaves and roots without dropping a leaf. 
And if that is nutrition-based, we will find out. And if it is nutrition-based, including pH, having to be a little bit more acidic than I'm applying so that she can absorb that, we will find out as well. Future updates, stay tuned. Future updates also from Daniel's Orchid Ranch and Simply Orchids, etc. Rhea P. Thank you so very, very much for joining me on this Care Collab. Always very, very much appreciate your time. Thank you everybody who's watched this video. Let me know if you've got Phalaenopsis chiliriana, if I've missed the mark and I, am, I know of your channel, I've subscribed to your channel, I watch your videos, please leave me a comment in the description below. I will add you to the spreadsheet for future updates if you are interested in doing Care Collab videos with us on this gorgeous, gorgeous orchid. I do apologize for not having beautiful, big, blousey blooms to show for. Maybe we can learn together and get it right for next year. Have yourselves a wonderful day, everybody. Take care and please stay safe. Bye.